Perdón. Hey, Mota. Hello, how are you? I'm doing good. Great. How was it, Mota? It was good, good. Uh, I've been trying to put up a interesting presentation for you guys. So most, most of my day today was preparation, but uh, let's see, let's see how it will go. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> let's see. Man. It should be, no, it, it should be pretty like relaxing. Don't it? It's, uh, most of our meetup is very conversational. Like in the sense that people, it's more engaging. People tend to like, if they have a question, ask you questions, stuff like that. And um, whichever way you want to go about it, you can decide to go with the flow that when people, when you, while you're doing presentation, someone asks you a question and you reply, or you can do your own presentation and at the end of it, you know, ask entertaining questions. So it's, it's, it should be very, very relaxed. I'm really looking forward to this because I see like, you know, you have like a bunch of like really nice graphs in your slide. Yeah. <laughs> it should be very, very interesting. All right. Trying to, let me see if I can share my screen with you guys. Uh, yeah, can you guys can. hear me well as well? Like, is yeah, I can hear you very, very well. Okay. It was like, wow, during this presentation, there's going to be a uh, time at the, at the end of this uh, presentation for you to ask questions and you'll be able to answer that. Let me give this to Mother and so we can get started. Okay, are we good to start? Yes. Good. Are we recording or did you guys think about recording? Oh, we are recording right now. Okay, uh, so today I, I hope that uh, nobody uh, will have any objection what you are recording, right? You, oh, you would yeah. be able to share this also as well, right? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate that. Now, just, uh, just uh, a disclaimer. So this is a meetup and we are henceforth, we are going to be doing videos, right? Recording videos and making those videos available to our members directly. So we know, so we have some members who would like to like, you know, share their face, right? Or allow, you know, their face to appear in the video. So if you are one, if you, if you have that, you know, that perception, you don't want your face to be in the recording, uh, please try to like, you know, remove yourself from video. All you have to do is just click on the button by your, uh, just bottom left stop video and it's you will, your face is not going to show in the recording because henceforth we are going to make all the videos publicly available to all our members right and i'm going to put the same and, on, on, the, on the group and do one thing also uh, today put it on the slack and also uh, in the chat room in the in the video chat room in the oh, zoom yes. chat room let's do that yeah Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mortas. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Just needed to get that out there so that, you know, to make things easier for everyone so that we can make all your recordings or your session available to everybody. All right, thank you. Absolutely. And thank you, Sanjay, for uh, the heads up. I think it's really important as well. So just, just one question. Are you guys able to see the chat screen or is it only on my side? Um, Are you seeing only my slides? Uh, yeah. Yes, we're, we're seeing only your slides at the moment. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Guilherme Mota. Uh, and given it's really hard to say my first name, feel free to call me Mota, which is my last name. Uh, I'm an agile project manager at TopTal, and today we're going to talk about the tip of the iceberg. We're going to be talking about 
the, the tip of the DevOps iceberg. We're going to talk about the software delivery pipeline. Uh, and in my introduction, we're going to talk a little bit about DevOps, and then we'll go into more depth within the pipelines as well. Um, before, before I start, I would like to talk 30 seconds about TopTal. And TopTal is a, an exclusive network of top freelance software developers, project managers, designers, and finance experts. Um, and we are located in, on every part of the world. So on chat, let me open the chat again. Here is our link if you want to join us or learn more and more about TopTal, I've sent on chat as well. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. So DevOps is this new thing that came up around 2005, 2006, 2008. So it, it has something between 15 and 10 years. And companies are still struggling to understand what DevOps is and how to work with DevOps. So some companies that I worked at, they thought it was simple, right? Let's start being DevOps because DevOps, it's a mindset change. So we need to take our developers and our infrastructure folks, and they need to improve their communication, collaboration, integration, and automation. They need to automate toil as uh, Netflix usually says, right? We need to take all of our repetitive tasks and all of our waste and try to automate in a way that will gain efficiency and will be able to deliver more value to our customers. And that's really easy, right? All you have to do is go to your developers, go to your infrastructure folks and say, hey, communicate more, collaborate more. It's like magic. When a developer touch an infrastructure guy, there is a rainbow that creates between them and they collaborate more, they communicate more and they are more effective. So I'm, I'm being very ironic here. I, I don't know if I made myself clear, but that doesn't usually happen. The planes end up crashing. We have differences on vision. We have differences on strategy and usually uh, operation teams or infrastructure teams have different objectives if compared to software development teams that need to deliver features and maintain software. So that's a, an approach that I haven't seen working really well. So let's talk about other examples because this doesn't quite work well. I've seen some companies creating the DevOps tower. So basically we want to do this thing called DevOps that we don't understand really well. So let's hire some DevOps specialists to our company um, and they will have the DevOps title and they probably know the tooling around DevOps. They will know how to use Ansible, Chef, Puppet. They will be AWS certified. So they are DevOps professionals. And we're going to create our silo with DevOps professionals so that they will work together. Uh, this analogy is funny because some of the goats there have beards just like some of the DevOps folks have. Uh, so it's an interesting comparison. But if we stop and take a step back, the reason why DevOps was brought into the picture was to break the silos, was actually to blur the lines between a developer and someone who works with infrastructure, was actually to get them to work together closer. So if we create a third silo called DevOps, are we bringing people closer or are we creating a, yet another silo on our organizations? And this is a trend that doesn't happen only with DevOps. I've seen on companies that it happens also with innovation. Sorry. And far, far away, you can see the innovation mountain, right? And it's the same thing. Some companies are bringing innovation experts, lean startup folks, agile folks to create a team of innovation so that they can think about innovation. But what about the rest of the company? 
it's just another silo that we are creating. And while this is a good approach to start on some big and traditional companies, because you need to start somewhere, it's also risky that you never be able to spread this culture to your entire organization. And this applies for DevOps, this applies for innovation, this applies for agile as well. And then we start seeing some weird things on our organizations. We talk about autonomy, about giving freedom to our developers and to our DevOps engineers to do the work in a way that they find a, a best fit for. And what happens on some cases is that the DevOps team starts doing whatever they feel is the best and they don't foresee the consequences. They do not follow up with the risks. They do not align with the other silos of the organization. And here an example is the security silo. So some organizations we have security experts that keep track and follow up with risks and vulnerabilities. And sometimes the DevOps teams that have this uh, title of DevOps engineer or DevOps professionals end up creating problems to other areas of our organization. And again, if we look back into what DevOps should be, it shouldn't be like that. That's not the definition of DevOps. So I believe that many of you have seen this picture before, right? Um, DevOps is the conjunction of software engineering, software development, quality assurance, and operations infrastructure. So if anyone could tell me if you agree or disagree with this picture, is it a good description of DevOps? Can I get yes or no? Or agree, yep, disagree? Yeah, fairly good. You agree? Okay. I used to agree as well. Anybody else? It, it includes those things, but it's not limited to those things, I guess. Yes, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Um, and the reason why it includes other things made me start thinking about what else we are missing, right? Because I've seen a presentation in a conference called uh, Extreme Programming in 2016. And then the presentation was about a case that was done on a company of DevOps. And the one hour talk was about how operations infrastructure folks were working better with developers. So I was kind of the, the mean asker on the session. I raised my hand and I asked, okay, what were the changes and impacts for your business? And the answer was none. It didn't change anything for our business, for our company, for our goals. The only thing that changed was that the developers and infrastructure folks worked better. So I would guess that on that specific organization, they had an IT silo. And that IT silo started to work better after they implemented their DevOps case. But their organization as a whole was still missing some parts of DevOps. If we keep going, there are other things that are missing into this diagram because this is just an abstraction and abstraction have gaps that we know they exist. And this leads to some weird things that I've seen on the market like DevOps is incomplete. We need to think about security. So let's create the DevSecOps. That doesn't make any sense because if we would include security into our DevOps mindset, we would have to include other things as well. So let's include UX because your user experience is also important. So we need to call it DevSecOps UX. Wait, we need to remember about the business. So let's change it into DevSecOps UX business. Um, and with that in mind, I need to remember all of you that within IT and software development, if there is one thing that we are really bad at is naming things. So when we named DevOps as DevOps, it was 
a too simple abstraction was the beginning was about let's unify developers and infrastructure, but DevOps is much more than that. Does this make sense? Yep. Yeah, Dev Business Ops would be nice, uh -huh. right? So does that change or you don't need to answer because uh, I think it would be tricky, but does that change what you thought DevOps was until now? So maybe it didn't, maybe it did. Maybe we can talk about this on Slack later on, but I just wanted all of you to have a reflection on the topic as well. So why this presentation um, entitled the tip of the DevOps iceberg? Because I'm not going to talk only about DevOps. The, my, my proposal is to talk about software delivery pipelines itself, but I wanted to quickly share with all of you that DevOps is much more than that. So I found this um, summary that I thought it was really good. It's, it's the union, DevOps is the union of people, process and products. Um, to enable the continuous delivery of value to end users. Maybe I would include something of value to the business as well, but I think it's a very good summary of what DevOps is to me as well. And there are many things that are missing that I'm not going to be talking in detail in this presentation. I listed some of them here. Um, they are mostly practices or things that I think are important and relevant for DevOps and continuous delivery. Um, and there are also things that are soft skills, right? We should be better at collaborating. We should be thinking about delivering value more frequently. We should be thinking about short and constant feedback loops. And then you may tell me, Mota, but I'm good at feedback loops. Our build runtimes are short. They take 20 minutes, but here feedback is a much broader thing. Here feedback is considering how our customers are giving feedback to us, how the developers are giving feedback one to the other, how the enterprise is working together as a unit, how, how this union of silos is growing on your organization. So to me, that's what DevOps is. And I think this iceberg is huge. There are way too many things in there. So, to get into a more practical question, I wanted to ask all of you, are you working with continuous integration today? So in your head, you may say yes or no, but we actually have a way to assess if you are working with continuous integration today. So the first question is, do you and your team integrate at least daily on the same trunk master? If your answer is no, you're not working with continuous integration. Um, yes, I missed some of the continuous integration tools and products and solutions there. I promise that I'll add, if you mention anyone on chat that I, I missed, but I, I, I thought it would be nice to connect your own reality and, and know like what tools you're using because Sometimes just because you're using the tool, you're not actually doing the practice. And, and this is something very common that I see like, yes, we are doing continuous integration. We have Jenkins, but just the fact that you have a Jenkins set up and configured doesn't mean that you are actually doing continuous integration properly. So let's get back to our test. If you said yes to you and your team integrate at least daily on the same trunk and master for each of those changes, your pipeline, does it start automatically? If your answer is no, and if you need to go manually to the web interface and trigger your pipeline, you're not doing continuous integration. So if you said yes, let's continue. When your build fails, most of the time, does it go back to green within 10 minutes or less? If your answer is no, then you're not doing continuous integration. So 
how many people here on this session are doing continuous integration? Considering the, our test. I'm not at a job right Sorry. now. So I'm not. Ah, okay. So, so you're you're excused. That, that's fine. So what, what was the question, Mota? What was the question? So, given those three questions, A, B, and C, are you doing continuous integration on your own context today? No. No. Hey, I do have a question. Like, I'm sorry, like if I'm interrupting someone, okay? So you see that you and your team integrate at least daily on the same trunk or master. So you, uh, so you were talking about, like, because uh, uh, in my previous project, I used TFS, right? And uh, in the current project, I'm using Git. So both of them have a different way to integrate. So are we talking about the TFS or VSTS? Neither. That what we call now. So, uh, so yeah, we really want to clarify on that one because, like, if we're using Git, then does your A work? Yes. So the answer is yes. You, you okay. can do trunk-based development with Git, and I'm not talking about source control management tools. So. If, even though they are very important, you have several different strategies on how you're going to integrate your code and release your code as well. Yeah, um, but again, like uh, Git is yeah. like decentralized, you know? So like you, you pull in, you check out everything and then you can work on it and then you do that. I think your A might work for something like VSTS or TFS, but for Git, uh, well, I may be wrong, but I'm not sure about it. For Git, you should be committing your chains locally and you should be pushing to the master server at least once a day. That's what A is saying basically. And the reason you should be doing that is because you should be integrating your code with your whole team frequently. You should have your code base always ready to go to production. Uh, and then there are other things to support that. You should be probably working with feature toggles and other strategies to make sure that you're always ready to deploy. Um, yeah, uh, I think some, somebody else was trying to say something. Oh yeah, that was me. So my question was, first of all, right? I mean, my team probably filled the, the last part C you know, you know, once in a while, right? You know, go back to green within ten minutes, right? Well, because I'm thinking, I mean, is it possible to maintain this A, B, and C in production at all times, right? For for A, yes, you can do that. For B, you can do that. But what about C? Sometimes he That's just go berserk in production. And uh, well, everybody's trying to troubleshoot what's going wrong. And I mean, the build is, is going to be, I mean, I've seen cases whereby it's definitely taking more than, it's going to take more than 10 minutes to well, fix. It, it depends, right? And, and here, so the, 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 the preferred answer of consultants is that mm -hmm. it depends, right? Yeah. But in that case, uh, sorry, I was reading, I was distracted by chat. On that case, you should have a strategy to either roll back your change automatically, or you should have the ability of doing uh, blue green deployments. So, blue green deployments is a strategy where you can have zero downtime. And you could have, if you have a cluster of servers, for example, you can deploy to one of the servers on your, uh, one of the servers of, on your cluster, and then you can lead traffic to the other ones if that 
node has an issue, then you can take that node down and, and spin up on a new one um, until you fix it. Or you can remove it from the cluster until you fix it and troubleshoot only there. So that there are many possibilities, there are many strategies, but the point is that you shouldn't have your build broken for more than 10 minutes and there are strategies there to overcome that. Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. I mean, just like you said, it's, you know, it depends. Yeah, I do, I agree with that. Yeah, it depends. And just so that you guys don't think that I'm crazy and I made this up, mm -hmm. um, who actually came up with this test was Jazz Humble, and he is one of the writers of the Continuous Delivery book. Uh, he worked at Opscode within Chef, and he's a very well-known uh, continuous delivery DevOps writer, speaker, and one of the, the persons that made it popular. So something that uh, I would look forward to get my teams on following those things as well. Okay, so let's go into continuous delivery pipelines. Um, I like the analogy of treating as a pipe because our pipelines will always be different because context matter, our tech stack matters. So if we work with mobile applications and if we work with web development, those strategies, they are very different and they look different. Some things are applicable for all of them. So I'm going to try to talk in a generic way where you can benefit regardless of your context. Uh, so far, so good. Anybody would like to ask anything now? Okay. So basically, this GIF represents what should happen, right? Like we have developers getting their code and they take their code and they uh, push to their source control management tool that can be uh, Git, it can be SVN, it can be whatever. And their pipeline will trigger the build. They're going to make some verifications with uh, system integration testing, user acceptance testing, and once everything goes green, uh, you can see those gateways that assess whether that commit was good or not based on their business rules and, and verifications, then it will automatically go to production. So some teams have it in a way that it's completely automated. Other teams, uh, even though it passes their own build, it doesn't actually get automated, uh, doesn't get promoted to production in an automated way. Sometimes this needs to be a business decision where a product owner or a stakeholder manually goes there and gets that code into production as well. So this is the overall idea. And there is something within Agile that it's called big design up front that we try hard to avoid, right? We don't want to start an agile project by defining the whole architecture or thinking how it should look like, what would be all components and all parts of our, our application. And the same applies for our pipelines. We shouldn't start a greenfield software development project and the first thing that we should do would be building our pipeline. We should probably start doing things by hand and learning the commands, how things integrate, what kind of tools we need within our pipeline, and then you move towards an automated pipeline. And in Lean, there is a concept called the uh, uh, Jidoka, and my Japanese is terrible, so uh, I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but it, it's, it's about autonomation. It's not automation, it's autonomation. It's a a process where there is a human being interacting with the process that it's partially automated. So what this really means is that in the middle of the process, someone will take an action, an action of uh, like my previous example, 
when the developers commit and it goes uh, and change goes all the way in the pipeline and it gets green, it gets approved, it doesn't go automatically to production because we need a human being to promote that version to production. This is automation. So you have an automated process, but someone needs to go there and actually take a decision in the end of your pipeline. And this is also something that we can apply for software development. It's not only for manufacturing because we have many things that we start doing manually and by applying the JDOCA, we can understand what kind of problems we will face before we turn everything fully automated. When we need to interact with the process, we can look at it at all the steps of the workflow and identify if we have bottlenecks, if we have risks, if we need to uh, take different care or invest different amount of time on a specific part of our process. And the same goes for pipelines as well. So said that, um, I included to our drawing a developer there. And one of the uh, recommended practices is that within a local environment, the developers on the team should be able to run similar steps that will be executed on your pipeline. The more they look the same, the better, because you have less false positives within this process. And also usually, depending on the development environment, you'll be able to get much faster feedback locally than what you would get on a remote server that you may get your agents and continuous uh, integration running. So up to this point, are we good? Any question here? Okay, I'll move on. So, as I was talking about the developer, um, what the end goal is, is that we want to get our code ready to go to production. And there is a metric that we use for that, that I call cycle time. And there is actually discussions within uh, process keepers, whether this is lead time, cycle time, there's a lot of confusion. I may be wrong here, I'm open to discuss, but I'm, I'm, I'm treating to you guys that cycle times means the time when the developer starts to work on a requirement or a feature or a user story or a task. And we stop counting when that feature, that work is ready to be delivered. So we keep, um, we keep measuring the cycle time of everything we do because we, we keep track of average on this and this helps giving us uh, predictability on when we are going to deliver a feature, how long in average takes for us to develop something and it also helps us understanding where are our bottlenecks. Maybe we have bottlenecks on our pipeline. Maybe we have the bottlenecks on our uh, software delivery, software development lifecycle process. Uh, this is a good way for us to understand better our situation. And uh, Peter Drucker said something that I think makes completely sense to this context. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So if we are working with DevOps, if we are working with Agile, we should be gathering more data than we are because we should be taking decisions based on data and not on opinions. So for us to start with, we can have on our developer environment a way to check the syntax. So let's say that we are working with a web application and within our code base, we have some JavaScript code. 
our team can discuss and agree what are our standards for writing Java, JavaScript, for example. And we are going to implement those rules or we're going to use some of the tools that are already exist to check if our code matches what we are proposing as a syntax. If we have this locally and on our pipeline, uh, we can get much faster feedback locally on our machines. And this doesn't depend on having a compiled artifact. So all, all, all you need is your access to your code, which you have on your pipeline and locally as well. Then we can have another step on our pipeline, which are the unit tests. So unit tests should be able to validate our business logic and they should give us very fast feedback. So they don't need the application to be running. They don't need to go to any of our integration points. So you shouldn't write a unit test that reaches your database, for example. You shouldn't write a unit test that requires, uh, I don't know, Selenium web driver to navigate to your browser because those are not unit tests. Those are different categories of tests. And this is actually important when you have software delivery pipelines because as you grow your project, as you grow your project, sorry, you're going to get many more features, scenarios, and examples on your testing suites. And you're going to have to take decisions on what you're going to keep and what you're going to take off. I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail on that later on. So when you are working with unit tests, given that you shouldn't go to a database or to a dependency on those kinds of tests, there are two common approaches that I've seen and those are mocks and stubs. Um, a quick way to explain stubs is that you create a method and the answer will always be the same regardless of what you do this method will always return true for example so you are faking part of your business uh, logic to make sure that the code that you are writing within your context and within your responsibility works so if the dependency sends you a no later on you can you can either uh, either test that with a different stub or uh, you can you can you can have different approaches, but th the point here is that you're going to safeguard your code, your responsibilities, and later on you're going to check the dependencies, the real dependencies, the real code from your dependencies. For mocks, it's different. So on this diagram, that uh, it's not very. Uh, the image is not very good. The idea is that you're going to test with unit, unit tests the business logic. And when that logic needs to access a database, you're going to implement a mock so that it won't have to go to a database. Uh, one of the reasons for doing that is that you get a faster feedback. You don't want to wait for the time that you need to connect to a database, to do a query, and then return the result. You want to make this abstraction and then later on you can validate if your system works well with the database. But you, you also should be careful for not testing uh, the database itself or the tech stack that you're using because those things are already tested and you don't need to uh, invest within your application to see if Java works or to see if uh, SQL database works. Questions? No? Okay. Are we good up to now? Uh, 
have a question. Shoot. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can oh, yeah. hear you. Oh, my question is... Question is, how, because I, I keep seeing in your, in your diagram, the business logic, the business part, most of the time when we are trying to orchestrate DevOps, right? Right? Most of the time, people that make those decisions usually think from Dev and uh, from Dev and from Ops perspective. Right, because most of the time when we are trying to architect our infrastructure or trying to change the company uh, life cycle to more, you know, to involve more DevOps, people that are interested in those kind of conversation are usually guys who are thinking from their perspective or from ops perspective. Now, how do we bring in the, the business logic part and the QA part and try to get the right people to be interested in this conversation? Uh, that's that's a very good question. So let me just clarify one thing. When I say business logic here, I am talking about the requirements that the developers receive to implement. So here I'm talking about, if you are working with Scrum and Agile, I'm talking about user stories with acceptance criteria, with mockups of interface that will tell you and teach you what your system should be doing in terms of business logic. Um, you could have, you could be working with uh, behavior driven development where you're going to be writing acceptance tests okay. in natural language. And that is a practice from quality assurance that okay. enables dev, ops, business, and everyone else to understand and use the same terminology. So behavior-driven development is a way to support communication and collaboration. Some people treat it as testing or a uh, testing practice, but it's not. And it's very useful for DevOps context. Uh, your second question, I, I think it was, how do we have this DevOps conversation with those other stakeholders, right? With these people. Yes. QAs, business. Um, I'm, I'm here to, today with all of you and I'm not a developer and I'm not an operation guy. I'm a project manager. Uh, maybe I am an ex developer, an ex operation guy. But uh, at the same time, I think that the interest for DevOps and the interest for continuous delivery have been growing within the last years. So I think there is a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of people trying to uh, benefit from the business opportunity that there is. So I've seen many certifications on DevOps. I'm seeing many people selling uh, trainings and consulting and that's normal on our market. That will happen always. But my point is um, we need to talk about those things. We need to discuss, we need to share, we need to have meetups like this and we need to create space for people that are uh, not doing the same things that we are doing so that they get exposed to all of this as well. I thank you, right? I like, thanks for that. The, the, I, I'm always having time, our time, bringing these guys, you know, from QA. I mean, especially the, our QA guy seems not so interested in like DevOps, <laughs> about automation for some reason. So trying to get them motivated has always been a question that I, uh, I have and uh, trying to see how other people go about it. All right, thanks for that. Yeah, so a, a personal opinion, like if, if you are working or if in your organization you have professionals that are only doing manual testing, uh, let them know that I believe that they will be fired soon or that their job will be gone soon. Uh, if all they can do is manual tests, it means that they haven't changed or explored or developed themselves within their career. Uh, 
I don't know, the, the space is getting very, very competitive for manual testing. And we don't actually see on many companies the role of a dedicated person to do manual testing. Um, I think this could be a lecture by itself, uh, but let's, let's move on to our pipeline discussion. Unless anybody else have a different question? Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Martha? Okay. Yep. Uh, I have a question about, uh, uh, like in the monolith world, there, there are teams, you know, who are called the incident management team or the tier one, tier two teams. I mean, they are not development. They don't change the code, but, uh, but you know, they, they manage the code or the ma they make some customizations at site to, to, to make the application running for a, for a particular customer. Mm -hmm. So now in this DevOps world, <coughs> Uh, where they where those people will fit in or they will be gone because that's a like b b big companies like you know uh, the big enterprises in telecommunication they have this kind of situation and this is becoming a big challenge i'm not talking about uh, uh, the small e-commerce companies i'm talking about the big telecommunication or banking you know those kind of industries so if you can put some light on that Mota. yes so I won't answer your question directly because I don't know what, what will happen with those folks, but I can, I can bring you an experience that I had on a bank. Uh, I don't know if you would consider big over 20,000 employees. Is it medium size or? Uh, well, depend, depends, you know, but 20,000 employees is, is medium, yeah, for a, for a big telecommunication company like in US. Verizon, okay. T-Mobile, at and whatever. So on this company, uh, we started an agile transformation, an enterprise agile transformation, changing mindset, ways of working and everything else. And one guy that was the manager, the head of uh, service support, he had an idea of making a pilot of getting one of his teams to sit next to the development team. So if I understood right the scenario that you were asking me, uh, let's say that we have product X and previously we had developers on one building and we had our service support folks in another building on the same company. What the, what the pilot was to actually get uh, them to sit closer to each other and they kept doing what they were doing before but just the fact that they knew each other and that they could stand up and talk and collaborate more, they became more efficient. So I think this is a DevOps example because we are taking individuals that are working on a different level of management and supervision and on another building and we are bringing them together and the results were good. So, so this is not uh, just a opinion or a guess. So I've seen this in practice, working, giving good results. Um, I yeah, that's, I that's okay. And that's a, that's a, uh, that can be a use case for the companies, you know, where people are co-located, but for the global companies, you know, where people are sitting like in Mexico, in India, um, uh, in APAC, Gala zone, so that's uh, that's that doesn't sound practical, right? Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Because they but have development to... center somewhere else, and uh, here in US, they only have the support support team sitting, no development. But then we can be creative, right? Like, what else can we do? Maybe we can take a developer to be working on the support team for a month, because then the developer will see the pain that the customers are having and the developer will be seeing the pain that the support team is having. And once he goes back to the development team, he will be able to prioritize or influence into the prioritization. And we can do the other way around as well. So we can bring uh, professionals that are working with service support and bring them into the software development team for a while. And they will learn more about the product. They will get better at coding. They will get better understanding the uh, 
patterns that we use, the standards that we use to code, and this will help the product overall. So I don't think that I answered your question and I, I don't really have a perfect answer. I don't think there is a, a silver bullet to any of this or to your question, but some of the things that I shared were experiences that I had on, on different organizations as well. Okay, thank you, Mota. Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to continue the conversation later on if you'd like to discuss about this. So let's move forward. Once we, once we ran our unit tests, they are going to give us a fast feedback, and then we can proceed to compiling our application. We can compile it locally, and we can also compile on our pipeline. And the process of compilation, depending on your tech stack, will generate things, right? It can generate um, a installer of your application. It can generate a package that you can deploy to your web server. It can mean different things, depending on what you're using to implement your solution. Then we go to metrics. We need to have metrics about your code because if we don't measure, we can't improve, right? So one tool that I've used in the past is called SonarCube. I don't know if you guys heard about it, um, but some of the things that Sonar gives, it detects, it, it detects duplicated code. Uh, it can help you understand coding standards. It can show you the code coverage that you have from your unit tests to your code base. It has a measurement that displays the complexity of the code you're creating. It shows how many comments you have in your code base, some bugs they are able to detect, some security vulnerabilities as well, depending on the, the stack that you're using. So I've used this for uh, .NET and C Sharp before. I've used this for Java. Um, you can use this for many different languages and, and tech stacks. Some are harder to configure, but you, you actually have options to use with um, pretty much anything. Hey, Mota, I heard about this, uh, this sonar cube, but can you elaborate a little bit more? Uh, not uh, all the benefits, but how does sonar cube does it? So do you write a code behind it or you use the APIs or some uh, I mean, how do you use SonarCube? Okay, so when you when you first set up everything, you have a SonarCube server and you have an agent. This agent, they, the, the agent can run locally on your machine or it can be a part of your pipeline. Um, some technologies you may need to inject something on your code to be able to detect or to run. Uh, and then depending on, for example, uh, depending on the tool that you write your unit tests, you're going to have to configure it differently within the SonarCube runners to be able to detect your code coverage and, and how many tests you have compared to your code base as well. Um, does that give you an overview? So does the does the sonar cube agents you we install it on the on the code repository where the developers are checking in the code before compilation we run the sonar cube uh, checks and balances or after compilation there are things that you can run before compilation there are things that you can uh, you can run after so that there are things that sonar requires you to have a binary or an artifact to be able to assess and evaluate. And there are things that they only need your code to check. Um, and this is also dependent on the language because some of the languages you, you, you can change them in runtime and they, they don't need to interpret the code and generate something else like Java, for example. Um, so there are differences okay. there as well. Now, does SonarCube has capability to 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 scan 
your Docker file as well, or it's only for the for the Java, Perl, Python, C++ code only? Uh, C++, Perl, Python, yes. I don't know if they have support for Docker files yet. Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Because all these all these features which you mentioned, vulnerability, security, bugs, you know, all these things can happen in the in the Docker file as well when we create the image. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was trying to find out and I couldn't find anything which, I mean, any tool available in the market, you know, which can scan uh, my my Docker file and tell me that okay, this is a perfect tuned image going to be created and you don't have any any bug in terms of like multi-layer or extra layers, et cetera, you know, but. I, I have seen for syntax checker for uh, Puppet and for Chef. Uh, I, I know it's different, but uh, I believe that you may find something for Docker that it, maybe it's not as complete as Sonar, but that, that, have, that gives you a faster feedback if you are missing a line or closing a bracket or something like that. So you, you may find something there. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mud. Okay. Um, and then I have a, a case to share. One of the projects that we worked on, um, we decided to use Sonar. And then when we first, first started, our whole build was taking 15 minutes. So to do syntax check, run unit tests, compile, run Sonar, everything was good within 15 minutes. And then one week later, our build became 20 minutes. That was okay. One week later, we, we end up on 30 minutes. One week later, we were in one hour. And that was better, right? Because then we had more time to have breaks and drink coffee and play video games. Um, and then back then, I remember that I, I read into Sonar documentation that um, they provide you a database on files to start with so that you can test and try out Sonar. And the reason why our build was taking so long was because our metrics were taking like 90% of the time of our build. So we basically, we switched the database into a proper database instead of the file base that Sonar gives you for, for free out of the box. But, uh, that's also uh, something that we learned that we didn't need to run Sonar every single commit to every single change to our code base. Because if you remember our continuous integration test, we want to be frequently committing our chains and integrating our code chains. So if every time we need to run a complete check on our code base, this could lead to waste. So what it's common to do is to create within your pipeline a separate process to collect your code metrics. And what I've found is that if you do that once per day, it will provide you enough information and good information to act on as well. So you kind of parallelize and define a frequency for your metrics to run that it's not the same frequency as, uh, as your code will be going through on your pipeline as well. There are a few things on chat, let me see. Okay, great. Any questions here about metrics? Okay. So moving forward, then we can have some automated functional tests. Um, and for those, I'm talking about the ones that in a web application, you're going to open the browser, navigate, go through different protocols. So you're going to do an HTTP request that is going to reach your web server, which is going to display your homepage or whatever you're requesting for your system. Uh, and those are very good. They provide very good feedback, but they are also costly in terms of 
feedback time. Uh, you can run hundreds of unit tests within minutes, and you can run maybe a four or five automated functional tests in a few minutes as well. So the level of detail of your tests needs to be very different and you need to separate those things. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've seen companies where all they had was one bag that was called automated tests. And on this bag, you mixed unit tests, integration tests, functional tests. But then when you have a problem, you don't know what is what, and you don't, you don't actually uh, know uh, where you should change your code. It, you take more time to understand where the problem is. So my recommendation for those is to separate the tests and categorize and understand what you have on each stage of your pipeline. So if you think about what should be on your functional test suite, it should be features that are most relevant for your users. It should be features that gives you business value that gives you cash that makes your company grow so those should be the scenarios that you actually automate and because this will grow with time depending on the size of your product or depending on the size of your platform it may very well be that you create a separate suite of tests for your automated functional tests that will run on a daily basis as well so you have a subset of automated functional tests that will be part of your uh, commit based pipeline that will always run and always be checked you may call them smoke tests to make sure that your application is up running that the version is adequate given your changes uh, but you may have other things that you don't need to run on commit and one example could be the logging feature so think about your web application or one web application that you maybe have worked on your career. If you have a automated functional test to test if login is working, after three years, this test never failed. Why will you keep running this test? What kind of value is it bringing to you? What kind of confidence is this test bringing to you? Maybe you don't need to test this on a commit uh, on a commit basis. And this is an assessment that you should be doing for all of your features. You should understand your product. And again, you should be thinking about the business perspective. You should be thinking about the quality perspective and take that into consideration to make those decisions. Then there are features that we can also keep on our uh, commit based pipeline that are features that we change a lot. So if there are features that we continuously change, we continuously improve, we, we need every month to change something to adjust a rate or to adjust something there, then we should probably keep them there because the risk of them breaking is higher than other features. Are we good here? Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. And then we have some, uh, some strategies, some approaches we can take within our functional tests. We can make them assertion based. And uh, the easiest uh, example would actually be with unit tests. I can write a unit test to verify only one specific condition. And if we follow this, then we are following a assertion based approach. So each example, each scenario only tests one thing. One thing, sorry. The positives, uh, the positives of this approach is that whenever something breaks, you know instantly what broke because you're only testing one thing and you already know the part of the code that this was running, the part of the code that this failed. The downside of this approach is that you may end up with too many tests, too many examples, and your feedback loop, your feedback loop might may be longer than it should. Another approach that you can combine or use for your tests is journey-based. 
So you can think about your customer, you, think, you can think about your client and think about what steps they take on, on your application to consume the service or the product. And then you can create your functional tests automated based on the customer perspective, on the, on the customer, customer journey perspective. I talked a little bit before about uh, BDD, behavior driven development. And we can also have functional tests written in a natural language. So uh, we use Gherkin for that. We usually write something like, given my user wants to log in and insert their email and password, when they click on login, then they should be redirected for the home page and they should be seeing their the menu. If we use behavior driven development, we start to write things in natural language and that makes everyone to communicate better than they would communicate. Business, infrastructure and development start using the same words for the same things, which helps communication. Uh, one of the projects that I worked before instead of showing to product owners the requirements, we actually had our product owner to update the code base on her machine and she would run the automated tests and she would see on her machine the feature that we just developed. So that was really cool. Nobody needed to present to the product owner the feature that we were delivering because the product owner could see by themselves with our acceptance tests the feature that she asked. So that was a very natural process and it didn't depend on any human interaction from the developer side, the business could verify things mostly by themselves. Questions here? Okay. So one thing that usually gets forget, forgotten are the non-functional tests and those are security tests to verify if your application has vulnerabilities, check for SQL injection, check for cross-site scripting, uh, and you have many other flaws that are commonly seen on your applications. Uh, you should also be testing for performance, for load, stress testing your application. You should check uh, how long it's taking to load a page or to, to uh, deliver a, an answer to your, your customers in terms of requests. Uh, and those can be part of your pipeline as well. Uh, it's common to take them out of the commit based uh, pipeline as well, but you should have them partly automated on your pipelines. There are things that you just can't automate within those non-functional tests. So for some, some security tests, you actually need someone to uh, check and do things manually, but there are other things that we can automate and work pretty well. And then we have another step for integration testing, because if our unit tests were all mocked and stubbed, we don't know if our dependencies are working, if our dependencies are online, if we didn't change anything on the contract of communication between our application and the API we are consuming or the, the other system that we are providing data for. So we should have integration tests on our pipeline to make sure that everything matches. And uh, checking contracts is a good approach that often uh, display differences between one party or another party, one system or another system. Um, some of those things you will require manual work. Um, in the beginning, I said that manual testing was dying, but I, I still see some of it there. There are some things that we just not worth to automate. You can just check them manually. Um, the same goes for security and performance tests. Um, and in the end of our pipeline, I just wrote production, but this is actually more complex depending on 
what kind of platform and application you are working with. So I've seen companies where they have a, an end-to-end -end environment where they integrate all the versions of all dependencies at the same time to test. So some companies have a pre-production environment uh, that simulates the same kind of hardware that the company has in production because the developer machines, of course, they, they are limited to that extent. They probably don't represent the same reality of a production system or a production cluster. So we do want to provision the infrastructure with uh, automated scripts and we want our environments to look as close to each other as possible but there are some limitations to that that we need to overcome with different strategies. Um, I, UAT environments, so, so some companies have user acceptance testing environments so that the business can check the application before promoting it to production so that they can take that decision of promoting or not. Um, and, and there are different environments where, where you can test uh, performance, stress, uh, where designers and UX can provide feedback and, and build on top of this as well. So that's what I wanted to share today. Um, I think we have some time to talk about it and to ask questions and, and to answer. Uh, my goal was to at least enlighten one person on the meetup about all of those things. So I, I hope that I achieved this goal and you can give me feedback and ideas and suggestions. I'm, I'm always open to improve my knowledge and learn as well. That's the, the reason why I like to talk about things. So thank you for your time and uh, I'm open to chat. Anyone speaking? I'm not hearing anyone. Hello, can you hear me? Now, yes. Oh, yes. So every time I talk about, like, uh, I think about DevOps. I mostly think about from the from the tool perspective, what tools am I going to be using? That's very, very important. But I mean, looking at what you've explained so far, giving like deep thought to the process itself. For example, you mentioned th thinking about the QA logic, thinking about the business logic, right? That's that's very, very like you know, very, very important. And I'm hoping it's something I'm going to. Um, incorporate more in our current company, provided the QA guys are willing to <laughs> to do some automation. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any question? Um, does anyone have any question? Yeah, it looks like. All right, so it looks like there's no question. Thank you very much, Mort. I really appreciate it. And if no, you have no. any questions, oh, you have a question. No, no, I was just uh, saying thank you, Mota. You are oh. a very good speaker. Oh, yes, Thanks. yes, thank you. You have like relax, you know, that really like interesting I, I, kind of vibe. I like I it. I was going to say that <laughs> either, either it was terrible because no one has any questions or I did it well, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you are, you are so clear, you know. Uh, you are so clear about your understanding about DevOps and you presented it very well, you know, it was seamless and in a flow, you know, so mm -hmm. I was like kind of in a story, you know. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, so, uh, so that's for the meetup. Um, very soon we are going to announce a meetup, right, uh, in Dallas, right? So it's going to be about uh, native. I don't know if you guys are very, very like, you know, uh, exposed to serverless architecture. 
right? Serverless is taking an industry by storm. It's, um, I know some people, you know, some people talk, they ignored containerization. Now we have Kubernetes. Now everybody's trying to be on Kubernetes. And I think, you know, serverless is going to be of, it's going to take a portion of production, right? A lot of companies are going to look into how to incorporate it into production. And on uh, Google, IBM, uh, Pivota, they also think alike. So they came together and they produce uh, native or something called K-native or anything you want to pronounce. So we are, given a, we are going to be giving a presentation in Dallas uh, in the middle of October. The details, the location is going to be published on the Meetup page. And we are really, really open to see everybody here on site. We would like to meet everyone, talk to you, maybe buy you a drink if possible. You know, just, you know, talk about native, serverless framework by Google. All right, so that's it. That's something that we have coming up in Dallas. And um, uh, right now, that's all I have, unless um, Tunde has uh, something else to, to say. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thank you so much, Mother, for the presentation. It was great. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, like Tunde said, we're looking forward to seeing everyone uh, on site at the um, DevOps Meetup here in Dallas. And it's going to be a really interesting one. Okay, so do you guys have a topic also in your mind or? Oh, serverless you mentioned, right, don't they? Right. Yes, serverless. Okay. So are you going to have a series or is it just one session? No, this is just one presentation. Okay. All right, this is, uh, this is just one presentation. Uh, we go through uh, native, the project itself. We go to its components, its feature. <laughs> And also we actually do a demo about application. So it's going to be a full, like a full suit pro, uh, their presentation. And we hope to see everybody there. Very good. All right. I'm looking forward. All right, thank you guys. Um, um, since we don't have anything else, um, I guess uh, we'll see everyone next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Morta, for having this presentation with us, right? Thank you, my pleasure. All right, All right guys, bye-bye. All right. Cheers, bye, thank you.